Hello, everyone. Uh, hope you're having a good time at the session. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to kind of offer you my perspective on how I've seen this journey evolve. Um, you know, firstly, you know, I think I've been associated with uh, Accenture for the last 16 years, but specifically around the diversity and inclusion agenda, what we have, I've uh, been driving that for the last two years. And it's been very self-fulfilling accomplishment because uh, that's something I think we owe um, to ourselves and to the world around us, right? So I'll start with this uh, research which Accenture did, uh, and it's termed as when she rises, we all rise. So this is our proprietary research which we did around organizations which, where women can thrive and where there is this culture of equality and culture of empowerment. And when that happens, uh, how the whole organization at whole flourishes, right? And so that's really, I think, uh, the larger context of uh, what I'd like to offer in terms of how we should be thinking about uh, the, all of these inclusion and diversity initiatives and programs today. First of all, I'd like to start with some statistics and offer you a picture of you know, what is the situation in India, right? And uh, we all know that there is a disproportionate number of women in the workforce. Uh, in fact, the, the stark reality is that in education, that's not the case. I mean, we see a lot of women actually getting into education these days, but it's just that when it comes to the workforce, uh, there is just not enough representation. I mean, just to look at a macro level statistic, um, though there are, uh, you know, 48% women out there in India, only 27% are in the workforce. Um, and, you know, other statistics like only 17% are contributing to the GDP and, you know, only 14% of Indian businesses are run by women. Uh, but, you know, I, to me, the, the biggest uh, reality or factor is if you look at um, the so-called uh, undergraduate professional education and STEM degrees, over 51% are opting for it, 51% of women. Um, however, only 30% of them are actually translating into workforce even at the entry level. Uh, and so there's that bigger gap, and when the gap further widens uh, as it, it progresses on to the next and uh, next stages, and it becomes the, the, I think the starkest gap is, of course, at the senior most levels when it's the chief execs and MDs. Um, and one statistic out there, if you look at all the NSC listed companies, out of the 1,800 chief executives, apparently only 67, which is like 3% or so is women, right? So that's really how stark the gap is. Now, why do I make these points? Because I think one, we all got to you know, acknowledge and uh, appreciate that there is this gap. And we all need to, I think, also do our bit in making that change uh, in whatever possible way in our own organizations. This is for ourselves as well as you know, the organizations we work in at, at large the community, right? So that's, I think, the fundamental thing on how, why I start with you know, look at um, where we are today. And though we are all talking about a lot of initiatives, uh, it's a long journey. Um, and I think that's why it's a joint responsibility of all of us kind of coming together to make this uh, journey happen in whatever you know, small way we can all do. Um, so now if you look at you know, why is there this disproportionate uh, number of women in the workforce, and probably some of these reasons are not very surprising to see. On the left, you have these social and cultural factors, and on the right, interestingly, we have these factors which women themselves have subjected them, themselves to, right? It's their own thoughts and beliefs, it's their own perceptions, um, and it's their actions. Um, so the social and cultural factors, I mean, as I said, not surprising, but you know, work-life balance, but I'll just offer my view that work-life balance is more a perception uh, by get women and by others that you know, it, it, it's not an achievable thing. To me, you know, work-life balance is if you're able to get your flexibility when you need it, and if you're able to really offer the stretch hours when you need it, that's work-life balance, right? It's not about every day, do I need to work so many hours or not? Nobody's going to define that for you. And each of us need to define our own work-life balance. So it's, it's more a perception, but that's one of the issue. Uh, stereotyping, of course, the saying that women has to be the primary caregiver at home and you know, men are supposed to be the bread earner and things like that uh, are other problems. Um, you know, permission barrier and conditional employment, in fact, it's interesting if you go through some of the uh, material uh, where women still in, in large uh, pockets have to take permission to go to work and even if they do, it's, it's with a lot of conditions in terms of you know, the workplace has to be near, it's within a vicinity and have to come back home at such and such time, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these uh, you know, still exist um, in a large part of the workforce and which is why I think it's important that in our own 
uh, areas we kind of try and uh, you know, acknowledge and try to change it. Uh, but on the right, what you see is even more interesting because I think this is, we as women also can do a lot about it. So one is this factor of women tending not to talk about their successes and feeling that uh, how can I talk about my success or how can I ask for more um, if I feel I need a change. Um, also that feeling that we need to prove ourselves more uh, or probably more than men or anybody around us uh, to succeed in, in life, right? And there's this interesting uh, uh, article or study by HBR, the Howard Business Review, which says nice girls don't ask. I'd, I'd encourage you to look it up. Um, so it, it's a lot of factors to say uh, why women uh, think and, and overanalyze before they go and ask, ask for a role change, ask for a, or negotiate for a pay, even though they know that you know, there is a pay difference uh, between uh, the other genders and uh, women, th th knowing all the factors why women really don't need to negotiate and you know, how we really need to acknowledge and you know, make ourselves in a position where it's okay to ask and it's okay to put up your hand and ask for help, ask for something is not working, ask for uh, a different pay and negotiate if, uh, you know, if, if, if there is a need to do that. Uh, so that's uh, really all of these factors which we need to, I think, acknowledge. Now with this backdrop, what I thought I'll um, go through with you is my own story on um, how life threw some challenges at me, how I overcame them with support from my own uh, you know, personal and professional mentors. Um, and in that process, maybe I'll offer you some perspectives. If, uh, you, if you find them useful, that'll be great. Yeah? Um, so this is um, my kind of uh, journey line. And so I was a um, pretty you know, happy, uh, I would say, uh, child as a child and uh, I took on, I went on to do my engineering, uh, I got into one of the good colleges, but I was not kind of serious in life, right? I didn't know I had to do this, I had to become um, somebody, and I was just not even thinking about it. And then uh, when I was uh, barely about 20 in uh, 1996, uh, my mother passed away. And uh, that gave me a little bit of a rude shock in life, right? But what it made me think uh, and realize is that one, you can't take life for granted. And two, you got to take control of certain things um, and move on you know, with things and take them to your advantage if at all uh, there is anything you can do about it. So that made me, uh, that day I made the decision that I would be intentional about whatever I do in my life and one of the intentional things is that I'll be uh, very, very uh, intentional about what I do with my career, right? So that's uh, a life lesson I think I got at a very early stage and I decided, you know, that I'll go on to do something which is, uh, which I can feel proud of and uh, maybe also, you know, contribute um, at large to the organization and uh, to the world outside. Um, so then I passed out um, of my engineering and, uh, you know, got into a IT career uh, from 98. Um, and in 99, I got married. Uh, and in 2000 was uh, the next kind of turn in my life where uh, one, my husband went on to do an MBA in a different city. Um, and so my father was meant to come and stay with me to uh, just be with me uh, so I could be alone. Uh, and suddenly my father passed away. Um, so that was again, I think going, you know, looking back, one of the toughest kind of uh, positions and uh, decisions I had to make in life. So one option was of course to leave my job and you know, go accompany my husband uh, and maybe look for a new job if, if possible in that location. Um, and also, of course, combat with all that loneliness and all of that stuff. So I decided that I would not uh, leave my career at that point because it's still early stages of my career. Um, and then on hindsight, I, the perspective I'd like to offer is if you look at career as a big marathon, um, it feels that if you're looking at it as a short-term journey, it feels that, oh my God, you know, one year, two years, how can I live alone? Maybe things are going to just you know, heavens are gonna just fall down. But if you look at career as a long marathon, it doesn't feel the same, right? You'll, you'll, it's okay to spend two years alone. Maybe you can uh, do something with it and get on with it. And uh, you know, that's the decision which I and my husband took at that point, that maybe this is uh, not really such a tough decision to, or such a tough thing to live alone uh, and continue in my career. Um, and not only that, uh, I then thought and said, okay, since I'm anyway living, alone, why don't I convert that to an opportunity? And so I volunteered to take a onshore client-facing role. So I went to Japan and uh, lived there for two years. Um, I would say, you know, very 
tough initially. You know, one, as I said, living alone and combating with all of these um, circumstances. But uh, also, Japan is a very different culture. There are language issues. There are huge cultural uh, differences. Um, so it was not easy. But uh, on retrospect, I think one of the best learning times in my life, both professionally and personally, where you know I had to really overcome and, uh, you know, these challenges and also learn a lot in my um, kind of technical um, aspects of my life. So that's, I think, one shaping uh, decision um, in my life. And so then I, I went on, I was there for two years and then uh, came back in 2002. And 2003, uh, Accenture happened. Um, and that was also an interesting thing because Accenture was just setting up shop um, in India in 2003 and we were not very well known, um, right? So it was not an easy thing for me to kind of leave my then very well established organization and move into Accenture, which was just in the kind of set up startup stages. Uh, but what I decided is that okay, I have to get myself out of this comfort zone if I have to really contribute uh, to the early, you know, early setup of an organization and I would not get such an opportunity being in an established organization. Um, so that's the reason I took over that plunge and the message really is it's okay to sometimes, you know, step out of your comfort zone and if things don't work out, I knew I had a fallback, I could always come back, you know, to my other organization. So sometimes we tend to, you know, over analyze these facts and probably don't make that jump. Um, and so again, one of probably my best career decisions was to move into Accenture. I've literally seen it. Uh, so in 2003, when I joined, we were like less than 500 people in, uh, in India. And today, we are about 200,000 people in India, right? So I've literally seen them grow, and I've grown with that to myself. Um, so that's, uh, that's, been, that's paid off for me very well in terms of the you know, decision I took at that point to make myself come out of the control. Uh, to come out of my comfort zone. Um, and then, um, you know, the, so moving on, you know, 2004 is when I had my first child. Um, and 2005 uh, is when actually I got promoted or my first promotion in Accenture. And uh, that's another um, thing I wanted to highlight to say, I mean, somebody was talking about male mentors. And uh, I would say even in those days where we didn't have these structured programs, we had a lot of male allies and uh, people who would stand up uh, for women, for stand up for the right thing, I would say. Uh, so 2005, when I was put up for this uh, promotion, I was on, I've only worked for about six months of that year because six months I was on maternity leave. Um, and apparently there was a question by people saying, she only worked for part, part of the year, so how can she be promoted? So my boss, who was a male supervisor at that point, um, apparently said that, if she had worked for six months and that six months deserved a promotion, I would just extrapolate that to the rest of the year because maternity leave is something she actually deserved. Um, we gave her that as a part of what she deserved. And if the six months really uh, you know, deserved a promotion, I would just extrapolate it. And I indeed got promoted, right? So, and the, the point is absolutely not to say the, about the good job I did, but really to recognize that there are men who are uh, really gender advocates or allies and. Uh, they, there are people in the organization like that who actually help, you know, women flourish. Right, so that was, um, you know, a big kind of aha moment for me um, to realize that. And you know, if you are in these kind of aha moments, then you also stick with the organization for a longer, right? You you feel like giving back to the organization too. Um, so moving on, the other um, thing I'd also so 2009 I um, had my second son. Um, and uh, 2011 was where I actually went up and said, uh, okay, I have been working in uh, one particular technology, which was Oracle at that point in time, for too long. Um, so I went ahead and asked if I could get onto a new area. Um, and that was, again, a little bit of a calculated risk I had to take um, to come into a completely new technology. So this was Salesforce.com at that point, not a very well-known technology, but um, I said I would like to learn it, and I took on that challenge. Again, got a lot of support from my mentors and supervisors uh, at that point to say it's okay if you, you know, if you don't succeed, or if that practice doesn't grow or something like that, we'll back you up for it. So I, I was uh, in a position to take on um, that risk and get into a new area. Uh, and you know, Salesforce.com has one of been one of the most growing technologies. Probably some of you already know this, but growing very well in the industry and hence growing very well as a business for Accenture. And that's partly some of one of the reason. You know, it's attributed to my success too. But but again, the point uh, really is to 
um, you know, take calculated risks, it's okay to ask for a change if you feel you know, you're, you're being stuck in a role for too long a time or if you want to learn something new, it's okay to um, kind of put up your hand and ask. And again, as statistics and research quotes, not many women are willing to kind of step up and say, okay, I would like a change at this point. But my message is really be, be open to ask, be open to take calculated risks and to ask for help more importantly to say if this doesn't fail, um, you know, can we work out things? And most of the cases you'll find that the answer is actually yes, you know, for all of them. Um, and the last uh, kind of uh, piece I would share is, um, you know, this interesting thing when I got promoted to a managing director in 2012. Um, and then that's when one of my a mentor, again, a, a male mentor, shared this with me that it's okay to stand up for yourself and promote your success. So again, I was just like many other women, were very shy of talking about what I did, right? And I see this with many women where we keep saying we as a team did it. So this was when I was actually coached to consciously say I did it, right? And, and so the coaching was it's okay to acknowledge your success it's sometimes in some situations. It's okay to acknowledge your success. It's okay to speak for yourself and, you know, promote your own accomplishment. And, and to this day, you know, I keep passing on that message to all my, all the people, men or women alike. But uh, more so women have this tendency to think, okay, sh can I speak about my success or not? So I especially pass on this message to say, in some circumstances, it's okay to speak for yourself. And, uh, you know, you will realize that sometimes if you don't speak for yourself, people don't know because we tend to think that it's very obvious and people will automatically come to know, but many times people may not uh, re realize and hence everybody is busy with their own um, stuff, right? And hence it's important that you know, we sometimes are okay to talk about our own accomplishments. Uh, so that was one very important piece of advice I was given, which um, I also wanted to share. Um, so anyway, so lots of um, you know, uh, interesting anecdotes to share, but the message is really being, uh, as I said, step out of comfort zone. It's okay once in a while to take a risk, get into a new area if you feel you're stuck. In fact, more so I, I think that uh, each of us actually need a specific, more so compelling reason to, to come to work every day, right? I mean, if I compare, typically men and women, I keep hearing this, that we need a compelling reason to come to work. And, and so for me, that compelling reason is, if, you, if you're not happy with your job, put up your hand and ask for something. And you know, most of the reasons, at times you'll be surprised that you'll actually get it. We think that we will not get it and we think people will not accept, but most of the times you'll, you'll actually get it. Uh, so that's um, some of the messages. And um, like I said, there are enough you know, male allies and advocates within our own organizations or beyond. Um, so don't uh, hesitate to take help. And in, in many cases, I mean, like in mine, I was success. I was, um, you know, lucky to find one and they contributed to my success. But, you know, if you're not finding that, I think you should look out consciously and, uh, you know, volunteer and ask for help too. And uh, I'm sure you'll get that. Um, so that's a little bit of my journey. And uh, um, I'd like to then end by, you know, these messages, um, but also there is a small video which uh, we've put up as part of our, uh, you know, When She Rises, We All Rise campaign. Um, so if you can quickly play the video, it's probably about a one minute video. When equality is a priority, a woman rises. And when she rises, the workplace is better for everyone. She is four times more likely to rise in a company that values diversity. She is three times more likely to rise where there are women in leadership. She is more likely to rise where there's a women's network. And where she is more likely to rise, men are more likely to rise too. If a woman is not judged by the way she looks, if she has flexible hours, if her boundaries are respected, a woman is more likely to rise. And when a woman rises, we all rise. At Accenture, our goal is a gender-balanced workforce by 2025. To all who strive for equality, our research will help guide the way. Thank you so much.